WCBI News at 6 starts now. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Caledonia residents will have to go back to the polls to choose a mayor and board of aldermen. That's right. The decision was handed down today after accusations of election law violations and the resignation of an election commissioner. WCBI's Victoria Bailey was at the meeting today. She joins us now live from Caledonia with more. Victoria. That's right, Joey and Andrea. Today was supposed to be the fourth examination of the ballots in the town's municipal election. But one candidate accused an election commissioner of breaking the law, even taking the only ballot box home with him. Now, voters will be on the line for another election. We want to make sure that everybody's vote is safeguarded, there's integrity at the ballot box. That's the argument Mitch Wiggins and his legal team presented Thursday, just before the fourth examination of the ballots. In a complaint and demand for a new election filed by attorney Corky Smith, he claims election commissioner Ken Byers took home the town's only ballot box the night of elections and allowed one candidate to view the ballots without the other candidate present. We've uh, received several reports and we've also got some uh, comments that have been made by several individuals including members of the election commission that uh, there may have been some uh, election law violations that may invalidate any of the results. After being presented the evidence, the election commission met and decided another day at the polls is in order. What the commission did, they set aside the election and say, you know, have another election. Uh, and yes, they do not have the authority to separate the mayor's race and the alderman race. They can either either throw out the box and so it's a new election. Byers resigned after the meeting. Now candidates are waiting to hear when the next election will be held. They arrived at their unanimous decision, which, you know, I had confidence that they would after looking at the facts, the law, and especially that the Supreme Court has already decided this on a number of occasions. The current mayor and board of aldermen will continue to serve in those positions until the new election is certified. Attorneys say the next go-around will have the same fundamental process. Be the same candidate, same ballot, uh, no new qualification period. Uh, there will be a new voter roll that have to be generated and I'm assuming people have time to get qualified to vote. Now I reached out to current Mayor Bill Lawrence for a comment. He wouldn't go on camera, but he did say, quote, the election has been taken from me and that's all I'm worried about, end quote. We're live in Caledonia. I'm Victoria Bailey for WCBI News. Guys. All right, thanks, Victoria. We caught up with a few Caledonia residents to get their reactions about the new election. Here's what they had to say. Well, from what I understand, that um, they had some sort of fraudulent activities going on, and I think that whoever did that probably should be punished for it. You can't just take stuff home with you and think that that's fair. I honestly think everything was fair. I think that uh, if it was a legal election, that uh, they should just go with what's going on. They shouldn't have to have a new one. Again, that was from people there in Caledonia. We move now to Aberdeen. Meetings, dismissals, and contradictions. There's a lot going on in Aberdeen. The job of the head of the electric department there is in question tonight. The mayor says the board of aldermen voted to hire Richard Smith as the new director. But other aldermen say the current manager, Brian Sanders, was never fired. Parker King talked to both sides of uh, the issue at City Hall and tries to sort it all out. He joins us live in the studio. Parker. Joey, Andrea, this is a story that involves allegations of wrongdoing. A mayor who reportedly wrote his own minutes and a disagreement about who has the authority to hire and fire in the city. It's a house divided in the City Hall of Aberdeen. They are moving forward to trying to, knowing the conflict that we had during this vote and you're pushing him through, uh, it's, it's not a good thing. When the meeting on Tuesday adjourned, there were three aldermen with their own take on the outcome of the GM position of Aberdeen's electric and water department. Two more and a mayor with another. As of right now, we made a vote within the last part of the board meeting that we voted, three of us voted, to, to rehire, but he wasn't fired. In a phone conversation, City Attorney Robert Fox tells WCBI the minutes from the board meeting have not yet been prepared and will not be officially
useful until the next board meeting when they will be certified. By law, minutes are recorded and then transcribed at a later date. There was no quorum at today's meeting, and business was continued until the next board meeting. The opposing side claims that there is no business to discuss. Alderman Sykes made the adjournment motion, and I seconded, and I had stood up and had walked over to the door to go out, and so had Mr. Sykes. The meeting was over. Bob Fox, again, the attorney, urged those other three to do that, and that was very illegal. The reason Sanders was allegedly replaced was due to some suspicious activity during his term as department head. Mr. Sanders has admitted to doing some things that were illegal, and I have been pushing for that from that point on. But uh, the department was running pretty smoothly, but it needed a qualified GM. The opposing side disagrees. Brian is ultimately the most qualified, and right now the, the, the team that he has down there with him are very happy with him. Things have already started changing, and uh, it's the way towards the future for right now for us. From the side of those opposing the removal of Sanders, it seems that this motion goes farther than just business. I think it's more personal than it is anything, and I would like to move past the personal feelings. If we don't figure out how to start doing things for our taxpayers in a common good, then we'll stay stagnant right here in Aberdeen. So, who is the head of the City Electric Department? This controversy has left many more questions than answers. The next meeting where this will be discussed amongst the board and the mayor will be on June 19th. Andrea, Joey, back to y'all. All right, Parker in the studio with that story for us. All right, time now to turn things over to weather. And Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson has a first look at your forecast. Keith? Stunning weather out there this afternoon, guys. Look at the 77 degrees in Columbus. That is a current look with our Alpha Insurance camera. A mix of sun and clouds out there, friendly clouds. Temperatures very nice, mid and upper 70s. Right now, humidity levels remarkably low for this time of year, and that's going to allow temperatures to cool down into the low 60s by 11 o'clock. And much like this morning, later on tonight, tomorrow morning, we're down into the mid 50s. Full forecast in just a few minutes. All right, thanks, Keith. The man charged in a Tishomingo County officer involved shooting is in jail tonight, facing 10 charges. 32 year old Lionel Joseph Statton is charged with one count of felony fleeing, one count of aggravated assault with a vehicle, four counts of aggravated assault, and four counts of aggravated assault of a police officer. The Mississippi Bureau of Investigation says Staten was a suspect in an attempted robbery of a Corinth restaurant this past Saturday. Alcorn County law enforcement followed his vehicle into Tishomingo County. A state trooper and Tishomingo County deputies then joined the pursuit. MBI says Staten's vehicle was disabled and then he ran from the vehicle with a gun. Investigators believe the Corinth man attempted to point the gun toward officers and that's when law enforcement fired shots. Staten's bond was set at a half a million dollars. When there's an emergency, certain men and women are always ready to respond. Each call is different from others, and some require multiple agencies and rescue missions. Our Jory Talley takes a look into what it's like to be behind a rescue mission. She joins us in the studio now with more on that, Jory. Andrea and Joey, many agencies and a rescue mission were both needed last week in Tupelo because of an SUV dropping nearly 90 feet from the highway down into Town Creek. The Town Creek car crash started out as a Tupelo Police Department investigation. We have certain resources that we use, and when we come to a point in our investigation that we may have to uh, involve others, other entities such as the fire department, the sheriff's department, and maybe sheriff's departments from other counties, uh, we certainly do. We all work together. And since there were missing victims, Tupelo investigators knew this case required a team effort. They reached out to other agencies to help with a search and recovery mission. They had folks out with uh, boots on the ground or in the water you know, on this case, and uh, but we we developed the plan and uh, said this is we set our objectives and our goals and what we wanted to accomplish each day and uh, you know we were the lead on that and the other agencies jumped in and helped us achieve those goals. It was an around-the-clock search for ten straight days. Fire Chief Thomas Walker says when they're involved in an event of this magnitude, they have to stay two steps ahead. You have to look at the 
the assets or the resources that you have and formulate a plan to avoid fatigue, to avoid, you know, the stress of what they're doing and give them an opportunity to come away from that scene, to go back to the station, to to decompress. From rope rescue, high angle rescue, and swift water rescue like last week's mission, these men and women are trained for it all. But each scenario comes with its own challenges. Anything that has washed down Town Creek from Up Creek that's hidden under the surface, you just have to, you know, every step has to be intentional and deliberate and planned out for reaction to knowing where that next footstep's going to land. Besides battling the terrain and current, rescuers also have to deal with the emotional toll of what can be heartbreaking work. That's why coping is part of their training. Some of them may go and hit the gym and just, you know, pump iron until they're totally exhausted. That's how they get rid of it. Somebody to talk to, a hobby, you know, things that they love to do. Tupelo Fire Chief Thomas Walker says his department, along with other agencies involved, are glad they could help bring closure to the victims' families. Andrea. All right, Jory, in our studio, thank you. Family, friends, and the entire town of Amory saying goodbye to Sergeant Kyle Thomas in Amory. Thomas was killed on May 29th in a training exercise in California. There are American flags and ribbons throughout the downtown area. Visitation for Sergeant Thomas is being held as we speak and will be again tomorrow at noon at First Baptist Church in Amory. The funeral service is set for tomorrow at 2 p.m. Amory citizens are encouraged to participate in the procession after the service by lining the streets at the intersection of Main and 3rd Avenue South. Sergeant Thomas is survived by his daughter, his parents and siblings and extended family. He was 24 years old. Welcome back. A longtime educator comes home to Mississippi to take the reins at Itawamba Community College. Dr. Jay Allen visited with staff and faculty at the ICC Fulton campus today. Allen was chosen to replace outgoing President Mike Eaton after he retired earlier this year. Allen is from the Jackson area and has served as president of Hopkinsville Community College in Texas since 2014, or rather Kentucky since 2014. Allen says he wants to build on the school's past success. It's truly an honor to serve an institution that's had tremendous leadership through the years. And um, I know that uh, that doesn't happen by accident to get such an honor as, as one of the top institutions in, this, in the country. Um, I know that it takes great leadership at all levels of the college, and I just hope that I'll have the opportunity to facilitate that, to be able to grow young leaders and to continue the leadership that our, our seasoned professionals have been providing. Allen also stopped by the Tupelo campus to meet with faculty and staff there. Fulton's new mayor takes office in July, but he already knows a lot about how the city government works there. Barry Childers has served on the Fulton Board of Aldermen for eight years and wanted to run for mayor after current mayor Lynette Weatherford said she would not seek re-election. Childers says Fulton is on the right track. Now he wants to help the city attract more industry, businesses, and residents. Uh, making this city a lot better place to live. You know, we're just always trying to grow and uh, and make it a good place to live. And you know, for home ownership and and people to move here, retirees and uh, just family people. And of course, his first day on the job is July 1st. Each weather is looking pretty good this weekend overall. If you're heading down the Gulf Shores tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday, low 80s. But there could be a few storms on there by Sunday. Our rain chances go up next week. More on your full forecast next. Your first alert weather forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. 
Well, doesn't this look like fun on a Thursday afternoon with a lot of sunshine in Fulton today, hanging out at the fountain there? Wow, what a great day to do that. Plenty of sunshine. Now, we're going to ramp up our temperatures later on this week into the weekend, so you want to do more of that, and that is stay cool in that sun. Also, with the sunscreen, too, because the sun getting very, very powerful, powerful uh, this time of year. Friendly clouds are Alpha Insurance time lapse today from downtown Tupelo shows those cumulus clouds moving across our region. The air very, very dry. A lot of sunshine mixed with those clouds today made for a pleasant Thursday. Hopefully, you could take advantage. Currently in Tupelo, well, we are in the 70s, dry air in place, and actually high pressure has come on down from Canada, and it has scoured out the humidity. Where I've shaded the color here, that is dew point values at least to 60 degrees. So that's the muggy air. Right now, there's a lack of muggy air down here in the deep south, which is very rare for this time of year in this part of the world. The ingredients for a comfortable night, dry air, clear sky, light wind, that's what we have in place for us tonight. And we're going to get all the way down into the mid-50s once again. We had mid and upper 50s last night, same story this night as uh, we go forward for our Thursday night. So not too shabby here. Tomorrow morning, 65 degrees, sunny at 8 o'clock, 79 at noon. And as we get into your Friday afternoon, a lot of mid-80s around here and some of those friendly clouds once again. So about 86 or 85 here in Tupelo, down to the south, much the same story in and around the Golden Triangle area. And also in the west Alabama, too, variable winds at about 3 to 7 miles per hour. But we will be ramping up our temperature for Saturday, 89, 90 on Sunday. More humidity here, but we are dry. And maybe you're going down to the NCAA Super Regional in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Game time Saturday and Sunday, 8 o'clock in the evening. And it looks like we may see a few storms or showers by Sunday evening. I think Saturday is going to be okay. But uh, we'll just see how it all plays out. High pressure controlling our weather for the near term. That is why we're looking at all the sunshine. But that humidity level uh, comes back into the region here as we get into the end of the weekend. And by early next week, our rain chances start to go up here. So here's our seven day. Pretty nice and warm through the weekend. Humidity levels go on up. Rain chances return as we get into your Monday. They continue for basically all of next week. We go back into the 80s. There's your forecast. Sports is next after the break. CBI Sports with Robbie Donahoe. Is brought to you by your local Ford dealers. Go further. They continue to defy the odds. At so many points throughout the year, Mississippi State was cast aside. No one believed they'd be at this point going to a super, yet here they are. And their head coach attributes that to their abilities on defense. We're standing here today playing baseball because we have defended it at an extremely high level all season. We're leading the SEC in fielding percentage right now at 981. Uh, what we have done this year defensively um, is a major reason why we've been able to keep this pitching staff going because we have a goal each and every game to give the other team 27 outs. We're not interested in giving them more than 27 outs. When they hit it to you, pick it up and play good catch. Hit the guy in the chest. We're not looking and don't need the sports center web gem plays. Just when they hit it to you, pick it up and throw them up. Simple as that. Saturday, Sunday, Monday series in Baton Rouge. Our Tom Ebel on the way to the box. We will have more from him coming up tonight. And not only was Brent Rooker named a first team All American by Baseball America today, the Bulldog Junior was named a finalist for the Dick Hauser Trophy. That's the equivalent to the Heisman Trophy in college football. Rooker won a four finalists. The other three are mainly pitchers, which one finalist, Brendan McKay, he's a position player as well. Rooker blowing him away in every major statistical category. The Hauser Trophy will be presented Saturday, June 17th at the College World Series in Omaha. And who knows, maybe we'll see Brent Rooker there to accept the award. Switching gears to football today in West Point, EMCC head football coach Buddy Stevens spoke to members of the West Point Rotary Club. During the event, Coach Stevens spoke about the upcoming football season, Last Chance U, and what to expect from the Lions in the 2017 season. EMCC begins the new year August 31st against the only team that defeated the Lions last year. That's Jones County, so better chance to take them down or crack at them. We caught up with Coach Stevens to give us an update on the team going into the new season. Uh, we're ready to roll. The kids are in summer school now. Uh, everybody's uh, working hard. The kids are working out. I think we've got maybe 82 days to go for the first ball game. So it's on us, and uh, they don't realize how much on us it is, but it's on us. And we'll have a new offensive coordinator, a new defensive coordinator, and it's. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's uh, everything's going really good. It's uh, we're ahead of schedule and where I thought we'd be, uh, but the teams the team's ready. They're excited, and uh, but we've got a lot, still got a lot of work to do, and I'm glad we still have 82 days to get it all in. 
and the Lions are ranked third preseason by one publication. That's Street and Smith, very popular uh, publication magazine that puts together preseason football rankings, awards, rosters, all that kind of good stuff. Northwest preseason 13, Jones County in at 19. Garden City is your defending champ national champions. Obviously, EMCC didn't get a chance to defend their national championship or have a chance to play for a national title due to that first loss to Jones County in the beginning of the season, but we expect them to be a well-oiled machine going in to this year. They're going to be very, very talented in the new football season. And lastly, uh, one final bit of note for you. A longtime Mississippi State professor and PA announcer Hank Flick has passed away at the age of 73. Still learning information on that. We do have a story on his passing on our website at WCBI.com. That's it for sports. Last up is your forecast. All right, we have a programming note for all of you Young and the Restless fans. You'll want to set your DVRs. Today's episode, which was preempted for coverage of the Comey hearings, will air in its entirety at 2 a.m. So I'm staying up. <laughs> hey, Victor good Newman luck to didn't you. do it. Whatever we it need was. to know what Victor and everybody else did on Young and the Restless. Yeah. All right, uh, weather wise, uh, no controversy here. Mid 80s tomorrow, 90 for the weekend. Rain chances next week. All right. Aww. If you missed, I mean, you can catch up in 10 years. It's the same storyline. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.